my great pleasure uh, to have esteemed colleagues in this panel. Let me uh, first introduce the panelists, and then we'll have an opportunity to have a, a dialogue with each other, and then also open it up for Q&A uh, from all of you. So uh, first we have Dave Bacon, who is uh, a software engineer at Google and a self-described quantum bridge builder, which is a very cool title, like it. Uh, Andrew Childs, who's a professor at the University of Maryland and a co-director of the Joint Center for Quantum Information and Quantum uh, Computer Science. Uh, professor Richard Josa, who's a pioneer of quantum computing, of course, and a professor at the University of Cambridge. Um, also, uh, Eleanor Griefel uh, from NASA, a senior research scientist and the lead of the Quantum Artificial Intelligence uh, Laboratory at NASA Ames. Uh, we have Matthias Steffen uh, from IBM, who's an IBM fellow, our chief quantum architect. And uh, Jung San Kim, uh, professor at Duke University and co-founder and CSO of IonQ. So the central theme of the conference uh, that uh, has been you know, active discussion on approximate quantum computing and what are we going to do with quantum computers before fault tolerance. And of course, we've, the field has advanced enough that now we have finally been able to realize, you know, working approximate quantum computers. So I wanted to start by asking each one of you, what do you see coming in the next five years, right? What is, what is this horizon ahead of us? It seemed like that, you know, some of these classes of computers were always far off and, you know, that horizon has been pulled in. But what's, what's the next five years going to look like? So maybe, Dave, I'll start with you. Okay. If you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, um, well, first of all, let me say I've been away for quantum for seven years. Uh, it's nice to be back, but what the heck have you guys done with this field? It's crazy. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, I was thinking about this question and, you know, my, my role in the last six or seven years has been as a software engineer. And at Google, we have software engineers and we have product managers. Uh, and that makes up a huge number of people at Google. And, you know, when you're a software engineer, you, you know, you're working on some product and you, you get sort of marching orders. We're going to build this product. And, and you're sort of like down in the woods, coding, coding, coding. And then your, your product manager comes over and is like, uh, so could you just change this a little bit this way? Uh, you know, can't you just do that? And of course, the answer is always yes, you can, right? Because it's software and it's malleable. Uh, but as an engineer, you're kind of like, ah, why are you doing this to me, right? Uh, and one of the things that I think is going to, to happen in the next um, three to five years and is already starting to happen is a similar thing that you guys may have observed before, which is between uh, the experimental side of the world and the theory side of the world, right? Uh, if you uh, ever encounter an experimentalist out in the wild uh, <laughs> and you're a theorist, what you do oftentimes is talk to them about their experiment and ask the following question, can you do this for me? Uh, or how about that, what that, you know, this other thing? Uh, and it drives experimentalists absolutely bonkers, right? Which is why they hide away and you know we put them at the end of the building and keep them in basements right <laughs> um, and I think that's about to shift and you know I the, the IBM uh, you know uh, uh, you know the quantum experience is the first example of, of, of a shift that's occurring in which there's now going to be an interface between this right uh, as the quantum computers grow to this next you know the next uh, you know, size scale that we're that that everybody's talking about. You know, tens, uh, now hundreds of qubits with better and better fidelities. Right? There's a nice decoupling that can occur where now all of those things that you wanted to ask of your experimentalist, they they are going to tell you the following. They're going to say, yes, run it on our machine. Right? Uh, and I think that's that's a that that decoupling will allow the people who, especially in this conference, who are building the new algorithms to start doing exploration. Right? And I think that's what is going to be a major shift in sort of how the field approaches the problem, right? There's going to be lots of graduate students who are hacking away at these machines, seeing what they can do. And fundamentally, that's still the question we have, right? In this conference, we've seen, you know, simulation has made tremendous progress in the last seven years. Uh, but, um, and, you know, uh, Aram, for instance, has heuristic algorithms that we, wanna, that we want to run, but we don't know what's in that regime yet. And it's a discovery, you know, it's, you know, discovery is a pathless land. We don't know what's there. Um, and so I think that decoupling is going to allow that process to occur. Uh, and that, you know, prior to now, that's, that's never been the way the world works. And I think that's really going to free up people in this audience to start actually doing really interesting uh, heuristic algorithms to see what's in that space. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing what, uh, what everybody builds. So, Yeah, very interesting. So you see a, a big expansion of the community. 
right, of who is going to be able to touch uh, these computers, experiment with them, and, and explore with them, and innovate with them. That's right. That's right. And even just the people who are, you know, the, it, it does take, there is, a, there is an overhead to be a theorist and to understand the quantum circuit model, right? You know, if I have to teach it to my fellow software engineers at Google, it's a challenge, right? I think that, that bridge will be there. But, uh, you know, I think that just getting more and more people in an, an exploratory space is going to, you know, uh, you know if, there is a th if there is a there there, I, you know, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be people, you know, lots of people exploring that space. Um, and, now, and now I understand better your, uh, your title of bridge builder. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so good. the goal is good. to be in between, right? Like somehow. <laughs> Great. So Andrew, what do you think for the next five years? Well, I think these are really exciting times. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, amazing the progress that's happened. And I think, uh, you know, over these coming years, I hope we will see, um, you know, demonstrations of, of quantum computations that look like things that we, we don't think we can do with classical computers. So, you know, quantum computational supremacy experiments. I think we can see that coming. Uh, you know, I hope that we'll see, you know, also better uh, quantum simulations. So, you know, probably better analog quantum simulations as well as, um, you know, hopefully as, as, you know, I was trying to, uh, uh, discuss a bit in my talk here, um, you know, maybe even early digital quantum simulations, perhaps not quite yet at the point where there are things that we don't think we can do with classical computers, but hopefully moving in that direction. Um, so I think, I think those kinds of, you know, uh, sort of working towards applications and, and showing we can actually use quantum computers in a, in a useful way is, is an exciting potential development. I think at the same time, like over the next, um, you know, five years, I guess, if that's the horizon we're talking about, you know, I think, it's, I think it's important not to lose sight of the really long road ahead because, you know, I think getting to quantum computers that can really do useful things and that can really explore, you know, kind of quantum mechanics in a high complexity regime, um, you know, it's a long game. And so, so we're going to have to work, I think, for, for, you know, more than those five years before we have such, such really uh, useful devices that kind of explore the full potential of quantum computers. So, you know, hopefully over the coming years, we also can, can take a lot of time to you know, do maybe less, um, uh, you know, uh, so things maybe where there's a bit less glory, but maybe things that help to pave the way for what we might do in the future, where we, you know, characterize the error models of our machines and develop better algorithms and develop better fault tolerance protocols. So we really, you know, are set to, uh, to you know, have sort of a long-term path to really realizing scalable quantum computation. Yeah, and I mean, and we do have some precedents in the past in the computer industry, I mean, famously in the semiconductor space, right? Like the sustained roadmaps where you have to work on multiple generations of technology at the same time and a combination of what's two years, five years and beyond, right? right? And I later would like to explore with the panelists like this sort of balance between science and engineering, right? And where do you see that, that uh, horizon moving? Yes. So Richard, your, uh, your perspective of what's ahead of us. Yeah, well, I guess my perspective on the whole subject is rather different from that of this conference. I mean, I have no real experience with industrial or applications, useful applications oriented things. And my perspective is academic fundamental science and just ivory tower blue skies research. And <laughs> no, well, no, but I think it's important because I think it's, it's getting forgotten a bit. The, mm -hmm. the imminent appearance of this fabled quantum computer has taken the whole limelight of the subject and and you can be forgiven for thinking that there's nothing else in quantum computing now except building this machine and getting it to work. Mm. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, there's, there's a lot more in the subject. There are pure theory sort of aspects like complexity questions, you know, like P versus NP in for, for quantum complexity class type things. And these are really important and just as exciting. Sure. And, so what's ahead in the theory side for us? Yeah. Okay. So no, but but the one point I really wanted to make was I think for me the, the the really most exciting possible thing you can do with your machine has not even been mentioned in this conference. I don't think. And that is to um, to verify or refute quantum theory. Now. Um, I don't, know, I don't know how many people here believe that quantum theory is actually ultimately correct um, and it will be the final <laughs> physical theory. Now, I don't believe that. And, and this machine is, is the perfect tool for exploring issues of that sort. Um, and, and I guess the, the obvious target is, is like the measurement you know, versus unitary evolution business. Um, and maybe even with 50, a 50 qubit cat state might already reveal peculiarities of superposition versus collapse. 
Um, so, and interestingly, the, the goalposts and the main thrusts of this point of view are curiously almost opposite to supremacy goalposts. Um, and I should say also, another thing I dislike about this focus on supremacy is obviously important for many things, but it, it has no scientific significance because you know, the, the level, the strength of our current classical computing is essentially arbitrary. This year's Agreed. supremacy is next year's classically doable when you build a better computer, right? So, um, but so for testing quantum mechanics, what, what we'd be interested in is not um, surpassing the, the classical simulatable barrier, but trying to implement very large scale quantum processes which are still classically simulatable. Exact opposite, right? Um, because um, there's no conflict there with testing quantum mechanics. There's no kind of sense that because you're classically simulatable, you're not probing quantum theory as well. Uh, so, so I think that, that's a, that would be not only exciting, that would just be unimaginably awesome if this machine could precipitate the next great paradigm shift in, in physics. Um, no, that's so, a and I great think, perspective on that. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, and I guess another point I want to make, a different point, is that the whole conference has been talking about using this computer for um, essentially standalone computation, you know, like demonstrating supremacy. It's all about computing power and versus classical power, which is obviously important and especially, say, for IBM. Um, but and, and sort of commercial companies, but there are other quantum benefits too. So if you think of, say, um, BB84 or teleportation, the Ellison Bob's, um, you know, computational ability is, is very minimal. You know, you can classically simulate it on a scrap of paper, right, or even in your head, practically. Um, yet it's still important, it's still valuable to implement it because you gain something else. You know, there are further quantum features of you know, state disturbance when you try and get information, all this kind of thing, which make that valuable. So I wonder if there's a, there are communication or cryptographic tasks mm -hmm. which require Alice and Bob to have, say, 30 or 40 qubits um, and, f f you know, in order to implement them. You know, for example, you might want to do a collective attack on, on a VB84 transmission or, or maybe some kind of secret sharing state thing where you have lots of parties so you've got a, a fairly decent sized quantum state you need to process or something like that so so there's more to quantum life than computational power that that can be useful in applications as well so i think that's that's another point that seems to have not really been thought about very much um, yeah. okay yeah no wonderful perspectives that, that's very helpful so eleanor i'll ask you the same question now from a NASA point of view and your own experience and your own center, what, uh, what are you most excited and what are the areas where you're going to be pushing for the next five years or so? Yeah, so what I'm most excited about is actually being able to run things on machines and being able to test algorithms that we can't test uh, quickly and that um, the regime that I think starts to be interesting for this is not the numbers that Ashley gave at the end, but where you can um, ask what can you do in a microsecond that um, might take a day um, because you can't do fast um, iterations if, you're, if each time you run something takes a day. But um, you may be, still be able to, that doesn't quite get us to the supremacy area, but um, uh, it enables us to experiment much more effectively with algorithms. And um, if you look at what's out there classically, uh, most algorithms that are run on supercomputers, you can't, uh, you don't have a proof that that's the best algorithm out there. You don't even have the uh, mathematical proof that it's better than last year's algorithm. Um, you try it out and see what happens, and there's constant um, competitions to um, find better algorithms, and that's um, only uh, something that the quantum community can do now. And the way I like to put it is that th this should end up having a huge blossoming of um, algorithms in um, quantum computing because what's the chance that uh, any um, uh, place where you have a quantum speed up 
are, is a place where you can prove by pencil and paper that you have a quantum speed up. In the classical case, this is rare. <laughs> and so we know that there are speed ups in the quantum case. Um, and we would expect that, that to expand out. Now, what does that mean for what we should be doing? Um, I think one of the scariest things is that means that we should be, uh, have a certain number of us or new people come in and do quite different work, where instead of trying to prove things, uh, we sit there and try to come up with reasonable hunches as to what would be a nice thing to try. And I think that this can tie in actually with the fundamental work that Richard was mentioning before, which is you really want to figure out um, what are pieces of quantum mechanics where, which might give you a, a quantum mechanical advantage. And even if you won't be able to take um, advantage of them to solve a um, practical problem of interest in the near term, you can run a proof of concept experiment, see if you can take advantage of that um, piece of quantum mechanics and have a new algorithm that maybe you don't have a proof that it could do something better, but you have some evidence that it can do something better um, and that that will really broaden um, what we can do with these machines. Yeah, so you're very excited about sort of like the experimental heuristical approaches to be able to exploit what the, you know, the machines could do yeah. and see you know, how our intuition combined with that access maybe give us an in interesting direction. Yeah, and one other thing that I think we should really concentrate on is hybrid quantum classical yes, algorithms. Yes, I agree. Yep. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Matthias, you know, I'm going to pretend I don't know your views at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so tell us what's ahead. <laughs> So needless to say that the hardware needs to improve from where it is currently. I mean, hardware is something I've been doing for many, many years. Um, we know the implementations that have been done so far, the errors, and we're not, uh, we're not simulating some of the quantum chemistry results that match exactly the prediction. So we need to improve the hardware. There's no doubt about that. Uh, if you look at Andrew's numbers he talked about yesterday, so even if we add a few nines of fidelity to our gates, well, we still need hundreds of millions, billions of gates. Um, that's pretty depressing, but there have in the past been many improvements in the fault tolerance threshold over years that kept coming down. That gate, come, gate count will come down, and maybe there's something in error mitigation. In Ed Fari's talk, um, he mentioned that the point is maybe some of the errors don't matter. Depending on what the observable it is that you're trying to measure, maybe some of the errors just don't matter. Uh, so some ideas about error mitigation, how to deal with these errors, even if they may be not fault tolerant, that's fine. So as long as you're still uh, computing something meaningful. So those are two almost complementary directions because the errors in the hardware will dictate uh, a little bit the direction of where error mitigation is going to head. And then it's benchmarking. Mike, I mentioned this yesterday on our hardware. You have these spectator errors. If you do something on two qubits, what happens to the other n minus one qubits? How do you do this? Um, and then and Dave mentioned this, is, there's, a, there's a bridge between theory and experiment. So if I wanted to run some of these things, like three qubit uh, randomized benchmarking that Mike also mentioned yesterday, I don't want to go in and just um, code all my arbitrary waveform generators and microwave generators. I just want to have something where I can go into kids' Git and say, I want to run randomized benchmarkings on qubit you know, 3, 14, and 19. <laughs> run, give me the result. And that's, that's great for an experimentalist to have. I can just go in and do that. And meanwhile, the theorist can then look at the results and hopefully infer meaningful information on what to do in the future. Um, so having said all that, and this is what something you touched upon, is um, benchmarking. So how do we, what do we mean by something ran better on a quantum computer? Do we mean the answer is more accurate than we could solve classically? Is it faster, but maybe not quite as accurate? And I guess it depends very much on the application you're trying to solve. Uh, there can very well be applications where you want incredibly accurate answers, and I don't mind so much if I wait weeks for the answer to come back. In other cases, I want something in seconds. And even if it's just mediocre, I just want it fast. Um, so what do we mean by a quantum computer ran better? And wh what are the appropriate metrics? And that's going to be a challenging topic to address, I think, but it's something that's going to have to happen um, moving along the future. Um, so I think those are my two cents. Okay, <laughs> very good. So Jung Sang. All right, so I would like to, <coughs> well, Dave mentioned about this uh, experimental theorist. I'm actually going to try to put my, both of my hats on and seeing, you know, talking about academics meeting industry in this field, which has uh, not really uh, I think a lot of the R&D that's still going on is very much in the, in the 
realm of R&D rather than a, an actual product, just, just because nobody knows how to make real, real commercial value out of this. Um, but I think there are um, pretty interesting prospects of what might happen. I think one is Dave and I talked about uh, being fools over lunch, because uh, each and every one of us who are in the field have to believe that there's something we can, we can do. Um, exciting and fantastic, and you have to have you have to be convinced that what you're doing um, is really the best approach than others. Um, and I think that's we need a lot of those very intelligent yet fools who, who will go in and, and t put their time and effort and, and put things on the line to to, to get it done. Um, and I think that's important, but it's also very important to accept the fact that maybe there are things that I don't know that maybe Matthias knows much more about, and, and so on and so forth. And then. Um, and I think that really allows um, us to really make a collective progress, even if we're in a position where our approaches are you know, different, maybe, maybe competitive. But I think there's a lot of uh, issues we can collaborate to, to learn, especially you know, these benchmarking techniques and how do we characterize the PowerPoint computers and so on. Now, on the flip side, I think there is um, quite a bit of uh, very heightened expectation that, that we may be able to do something really important and useful. Um, and yet, I don't think we, any of us really know what that thing is, right, as, as uh, Richard mentioned about. Um, so, so there, I think we, there will be probably some uh, as the rubber meets the road, meaning as people bring up real systems where we can, some of these real interesting ideas can start to be tested, uh, we may be surprised. There may be some complexity um, problems so that the quantum mechanics may not scale as we expected. Or, um, or maybe some approaches we felt was very solid may have you know, blindsided by, by some problems we didn't know about today. So I think there will be a lot of this shaking out of uh, you know, what, is, um, what you believe in has, has worked out and what hasn't. And I, I think that's a good thing. Some, some will be disappointed than others. But I think all of that reckoning will actually give us a better insight of where to go in the future. Um, and I think that type of um, you know, new discovery in this complexity area of quantum, I think it's going to be some of the really, really interesting um, discoveries that, that's yet to come. And on the flip side, and, and in order to keep that going, I think it's really, really important that our field continues uh, to maintain the excitement so that the young, young uh, bright, brightest minds feel like jumping into this field is more, more exciting and interesting than going in, out and doing something else. And I think that talent Continued attraction of good talent is really the fuel that will keep us going um, and look for these breakthroughs that will really make some of these efforts really useful. So I think it's really important that we all keep up um, that momentum <laughs> and keep attracting the brightest minds uh, to come and work with us. So let me segue a little bit and perhaps on, on your thing that you brought up and it's been brought up, and David, you were talking before about also like community and other stakeholders that we want to bring along. If I could ask uh, you know, all of you to reflect, if there was um, another community or a different you know, a scientific discipline that you think would be important where we are right now for the next coming years to sort of start bringing on board because they either bring a skill set or a perspective or a requirement that you think is important to consider right, as we continue to advance, what would that be? I mean, you know, for your own uh, work, what kind of collaborators or colleagues would you seek in the coming years that you think will be particularly productive? I mean, we've talked about software engineers at one extreme of the application, right, where you're trying to apply it more. Um, but, you know, you, you know, you were talking about perhaps that we can use it as a scientific instrument in its own right to test theories. So who would you like to reach out to? I can, oh. I can take a good, funny Go first ahead. yes, which is that <laughs> at Google, everything is solved by machine intelligence. <laughs> so obviously, we just need more people in machine intelligence to optimize our problems. Uh, <laughs> but more seriously, I do think you know, the community will start to, to you know, as, as a lot of groups are, you know, are starting to go the transition from physicist to engineer. And right, there is definite difference, having made that transition myself into become a software engineer, of the engineering mentality of how you, how you structure, how you're going to have a team that builds something large. And so I think, uh, you know, pulling in people who have, are coming from engineering departments or coming from engineering, you know, in, in industry from other parts of the, of the company, pulling those in is gonna be a huge change in a lot of the, a lot of the tone. That's already occurred to different extents in different groups, right? But, uh, you know, I write a lot of code every day and if I write code that I see written by a physicist, I have to tell you, I sometimes 
pull my hair out. <laughs> uh, and you know, I think that that's going to change a lot of the like that'll that there's, there'll be a maturity of the tooling that you're building. And of course, at the same time, you're doing the hardest experiments in the world to build the most important thing in the world. And so there's a tension there because you want to move fast as well. But I think we need to bring in great engineering practices, or or you know. If you've read The Soul of the New Machine, you'll end up going nowhere, so. Um. Okay, so. To follow up. Oh, who else, um, yeah. Uh, also related to that, I think we want to bring in domain experts, but, mm -hmm. and people who are really doing the top of the line algorithms for a applications that we're interested in. But we need to find the right people because they're going to be the people who want this to solve their problem better tomorrow and they won't have the patience, but finding the people who find this area exciting, would like to collaborate and are willing to look the long distance, um, I think will just be a huge help to That's this same. field. And some of the greatest pleasure of working at NASA is to have found a couple of those people um, to work with, and we're, um, I think the whole field will benefit from, from more such people coming in. Okay, no, that's very, yeah. I think that that's right, right? Because we're going to have to be able to bridge these communities together and see what is that continuum of what you can do, right, with different approaches right. and techniques. Yeah. Other community? Well, maybe I can make a kind of related point, uh, maybe not exactly directly answering your question, but that I really think that our, our area is already a pretty big tent. I mean, you know, quantum, quantum computation is about sort of using physics to do computation. So it kind of naturally brings together physics and computation. And you know, through you know, meetings like this one, we have people from both sides, you know, physics and computation, and also other areas of science you know, who are all interested in these questions. And, and now, because this area has been going for you know, uh, so long, I mean, it's kind of routine at these kinds of meetings that you hear physicists saying, you know, certainly we can't solve that problem because it's NP-hard. Right? And some, so somehow this concept from computer science has just been, been brought into the language of physics. And you know, the other way around, we see people using, uh, you know, using ideas from physics to think about computation. So um, I, think that's, I think that's a fantastic thing that to a great extent has already happened. And I think we can kind of hope to, to bring more people into our community and, and bring you know, new kinds of expertise. But I think it, I think it really is an area that um, in some ways is ideal for bringing together people from different disciplines. Yeah, no, and you're right, and it, and it is already a big tent, right? But uh, I, think, I think we're going to see a very significant expansion in the coming years. And it'll be interesting to also to see how the conferences, right, and that dialogue evolves and the language that gets used, you know, associated with that. Yeah. And I think just, just to the point of the domain experts, I think one thing to be very, uh, you know, what we're really looking for also are people who are, uh, Skeptical in some sense, but but skeptical, but but movable, right? Um, because I think there is a there is a danger that when you bring in somebody to work in a domain that and merge quantum computing, all they do is think about how can quantum computers solve my problem. And you need a, a mentality that is, I want to do the best in the world for that domain. What is that? Um, and th so that's a different type of, you know, I can be a domain expert in an area, but not necessarily a domain expert who will also approach it in sort of a red team way, which I think is a, a very important distinction. So and having a, yeah. oh, sorry. Oh, please, please. And having a sort of white hat, black hat for the algorithms so that you have um, people trying to push the quantum algorithms forward, but also trying to put the, uh, push the classical algorithms forward. And everybody views that as a team effort. Um, we don't hate each other. We want to build off of each <laughs> other. And at the very least, we'll come up with um, interesting, we'll continue to come up with very interesting classical algorithms as well as um, quantum. Yeah, let me just say, I mean, that that's actually one practice that within IBM you know, we believe very strongly, right, of continuing to push the boundaries of what you can do with simulation, with classical computer simulation, and absolute limit, because as you were saying, that's a moving frontier, right? Yeah, it keeps sure, getting yeah, better yeah. and better, and we're gonna get better and better at it, and we're gonna push that, you know, to the absolute limits and forever. And then, but we're also doing the other one in parallel, and, but, but it's not, you know, a nasty competition. Right. It's like that's how computing advances and moves forward, right? And, and the benefit yeah. of the two worlds make everybody better. Well, with classical computers, when they first emerged, I mean, no one had any idea what to do with them, right? That's it was, true. It was meant to be just for solving um, partial differential equations by numerical methods and things. And, and no one thought about computer games or internet or email or word processing. And now everyone does it, right? So, so do you think when we have this quantum computer, then a similar kind of creative explosion will occur. And I, and I think, I mean, and this has been touched a little bit about it, I think that that's what's going to happen also in the coming years, that 
that we're going to expose this new tool, a new capability, and people are going to approach it creatively too, in ways that we don't anticipate and it won't be driven by proofs and so on, and people will just try things out and, and, and see what's, what's interesting. So let me ask uh, then all of you, I mean, since uh, it was alluded to about like, you know, some of you know, mistakes or pitfalls that we could encounter, I'd love to hear your perspective of what should we avoid? I mean, what are you know, things that you may be concerned about right, in the coming years that you would say, let's not do that. Let's not make that mistake. What, what would you say? Well, I think Jung Seng mentioned uh, kind of uh, hype and uh, high expectations. And I think there's a lot of concern, you know, potential concern about, uh, you know, kind of um, over-promising and under-delivering. So I think, uh, you know, um, if we sort of, um, you know, set too, too near a horizon for when we, when we say we'll be able to deliver, you know, large machines that we can use to do practical computations and then it doesn't happen, um, people will be disappointed, will be disappointed. Yeah. And, uh, and so I think that's I think we have to be cautious and and sort of you know as I was saying before kind of realize that we have to we uh, have to go the long haul okay so I, I can follow up in, in um, what Richard said um, you know I think the kind of engineers or, or, or algorithm people that we're trying to push this forward are not necessarily that uh, people that we see or that exist today just because the frontier of what's exciting and out there is just so ill-defined. Um, so I think it's very important for us to keep in mind that uh, whatever your short, near, or far term uh, goals that you set, um, this is going to be a moving target. It is actually going to evolve um, based on the uh, time, effort, and the productivity that we as a community generate. Right? So it's not, we're, we're not walking on a well-set path. We're, we're trying to create and understand what that path forward is. Um, so I think the successful um, you know, talent that we need to pull in um, is going to have to have an open mind. And people like Dave Bacon who said, okay, I'm going to leave my field and go become a software engineer for a while. Um, it's, as, as we said, it's a foolish thing to do, given give, leaving all the things behind. But that is exactly the kind of mindset that we need because whatever we're going to have to figure out how to do um, is, is not going to come from, there isn't somebody out there who will be able to tell us exactly what we should do. I think it's, uh, it's going to, we will need each other's help and the expertise, but we also have to approach it with a, with a very open mind because it's a big challenge ahead of us. So I think making sure that we have that open mind, um, accepting the fact that yes, I, I really believe in what I'm doing, but also accept the fact that I may be missing something, I may need help from others, um, to, to make sure that we, we continue to explore the, the realistic and practical opportunities that's ahead of us. I think having that mindset is very, very important. Yeah, I think also <clears throat> moving forward, um, having the future generation of quantum scientists is incredibly important. Ones that already speak the language of you know, P versus NP and at the same time being familiar with the physics. Um, so I think there's great value in academic institutions in generating the next leadership generation for quantum computing while at the same time also being able to explore completely crazy new ideas as they apply to quantum information and quantum computing. I mean, we often or sometimes don't see what's behind the exit sign. You know, we keep plugging along the problems that we encounter, encounter every day, but there may be other completely novel ideas on how to solve and tackle some of these issues in a, in a much better and different way. So I do believe that fundamentally academic institutions play an absolutely incredibly important role. This is not just something that should be shipped out to industry, we're done, okay, fine. No, I mean, I think uh, universities really play an important role uh, for future hires, uh, as well as, um, yeah, coming up with the next idea. Following, following on from that, um, partly because quantum computing seemed so far out for a while, this is a very open field with everybody talking to everybody, and um, I've started to have a little bit of a fear of a change in culture um, because of the market forces and the hype. And I think we all need to really push against that, that the challenges are still so significant that we all need each other and we all need to work together. Um, and that um, not just the academic work, but the open mm -hmm. um, work um, is where we need to stay for, for a long time still. So let's all push against any forces in uh, opposite direction. Good advice. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Good advice. So I'm going to open it up uh, in a minute uh, for questions to so start thinking about, you know, things that you'd like to ask the, the panel. Um, but, you know, one, one last question I'd like to ask you uh, before I open it up. 
So now to the public, right? If, if there was one thing that you would like the public to know about quantum computing and not have a misconception, that's something that you say, this would be a helpful either concept or a way to understand it, uh, you know, that would ground them, right, against the hype, uh, as an example. What, what would you share? What, what would you tell them uh, as a mechanism to understand what's happening? This is your, your opportunity to tell them how to be grounded. <laughs> All right. Let, <laughs> what me actually, you say? let me actually start. Um, so I was having a conversation with one of my, one of my colleagues who, um, who is a software uh, engineer all his life. And he basically said he had a dad who was a computer scientist. And his dad started teaching him how to code at the age of five before he could like, add numbers. Right. So, and if you think about that, okay, that's that's weird. But in, in this day and age, <laughs> that starts to become a very important skill set that we, we do want our kids to start thinking about it that way. Maybe maybe not all of them, but that aspect <laughs> starts to become important. Um, and if you go back and think about you know how we teach every first graders to add numbers, I'm sure a thousand years ago that was now we taught our kids, right? And 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 I think the way that we approach um, new science or or framework. Um, at a very young age, I think, I think it's totally possible. Um, and I think those are the things we have to think about. I think we have to break the myth that quantum mechanics is something that you know, is, is crazy and mysterious and can't understand. I, I'm sure adding numbers 1,000 years ago to the general public was a mysterious thing. But we don't think that way anymore because we train people at a very young age um, that this is how the world works. And therefore, if you have those skill sets, then you can actually um, you know, contribute uh, in a more meaningful way. So. Um, I think the, the, the notion that quantum mechanics is mysterious, um, it is a matter of training. Nobody is born how to ride bicycles. But once you train them, it becomes very natural uh, to them. So I think those are the things that I think we should think about <laughs> more. Yeah, Charlie is a you know, passionate advocate at that very point that you're making, right? I'll try to make it less mysterious and that when people say this is something I cannot understand, he said, yes, you can, right? And let's, let's make an effort. It's a great point. So what else? What would you share? On sort of the opposite side, um, some young people hear that quantum computing is about to be there and solves all problems. And one problem with that is that then they think there isn't anything for them to do. <laughs> and, um, Hardly and, the case, right? Hardly right. the case. And so, so we should make sure that um, such people understand that there's a huge amount to do there and okay. that we'd love to have them come in. So, so there still should be some mystery. Um, okay, um, <laughs> all right. So we're balancing things. That's great. What else? What would you educate them on? I mean, certainly I think that there's a misconception about sort of the, where the power of quantum computers comes from mm -hmm. and that somehow, you know, I mean, you see this um, sometimes in the popular press that somehow, somehow uh, you know, quantum computers explore all possibilities in superposition and somehow, you know, uh, you know, by doing that can sort of solve really hard search problems in polynomial time, you know, that basically they can pick out the, the needle from the haystack and, you know, we know that that's not the case that you know we don't we don't expect to be able to solve let's say NP complete problems in polynomial time there you know we need very specific structure to be able to to uh, solve problems efficiently with quantum computers um, so you know I think it's I think something that um, it's good to get across is that somehow quantum computing is not a you know magic bullet that solves all problems I mean it's related to the, the point that you're making um, that somehow uh, and and it, you know in many ways that makes it more interesting because there's more to do we you know we we need to try to understand what is the kind of structure that we can exploit um, you know if we want to be able to find new quantum algorithms understand you know what problems are easy for quantum computers but also what problems are hard for quantum computers. Okay. Any any other thoughts? I mean, well, I guess for, ahead, the, please, for the non-scientific public, right? So, right, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't attempt to, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's this temptation to kind of make quantum mechanics really bizarre and paradoxical and so on. And that just confuses people, right, I think. Um, so I would simply say it's just a powerful new resource like atomic energy. It relies on physics beyond, it's real physics beyond our day-to-day experiences, um, but it can be understood if you take the trouble of learning some maths and so on. And it can be used for tremendous benefit, but also great harm, and that's up to the whim of the, the user. And um, Yeah, and that's all it is. So. Okay. 
Yeah, I was just going to say I think there's a there's an important follow-on to, to to what uh, Andrew was saying that I think it's extremely important to also admit that we don't understand a lot of things, mm -hmm. right? So we don't really understand if quantum mechanics breaks down, uh, and we don't understand the power of quantum computation, right? Like if I ask you where does it come from, it's still hard to pin that down, right? I think um, I think if we do that in our public, like oftentimes when the journalist comes to you, you say something the journalist thinks you're saying it definitively. We should try to be humble in saying that we don't know. And that will give uh, people who are on the outside this idea that there's much to explore and learn, which is, I think, what we all know. But that doesn't sometimes come across when we talk externally, because it comes across as, uh, you know, uh, you know that this is a solved problem. And I think we need to be very careful about that uh, in our discussions with the public. Um, yeah, and these 30-second sound bites can be very difficult. Like, explain <laughs> quantum computing in 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> not quite. People have been doing this for decades, walk and they still struggle. Just struggling. walk so away. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Very good. OK, let's open it up for the audience. Questions that you have for the panelists. And we have, uh, David has some microphones. I can bring them up. Antonio. Come on, some questions. You must have some. Oh. One second, uh, if you could wait just a second for the microphone. Stand up or can I just? <laughs> sure, you can. You can stand up. <laughs> just stop. Um, I guess you guys have a quantum computing systems that you want to build in your mind, each of you. And uh, maybe I have two questions. So the first question is, do you think that road to get there will be more incremental adiabatic process? Or do you think that we'll need a few breakthrough? to get there. And if you think that we need like, a few breakthrough to get there, then what kind of breakthrough that you think we have to make? Looks like it's for you and me. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and hardware builders. There you go. Yeah, so um, I, I mean, progress is very rarely linear. I mean, it's, it, it goes in incremental steps. You might be stuck for quite a while. And you, know, you, you probably remember some of these early days from one of our programs where we had these hot qubits and we just sat around that for two years until we finally figured something out. Um, that was a big step function that allowed us to go to the next level. And I anticipate this happening for uh, future devices as well. And some of these things happened by accident. I think that that particular invention was because somebody wanted to prove the opposite. <laughs> um, and so that so that's so that's you know, on, on that particular part, um, it's going to be very, very step function wise. And when the next um, breakthrough comes, it's, it's impossible to predict. Right? I mean, it's, it happens when it happens. <laughs> We're all working on it and working towards it. Um, in terms of the system, I, I, I don't know. I mean, for superconducting qubits, I guess in the early days, people said, ah, there's no way you'll get a microsecond. And people figured out how to get a microsecond. Then it was, oh, well, you know, you can't get to 10 microseconds. And people got to 10 microseconds. So you're saying, you hear the same thing in ion traps as well. Well, you have these big ion traps. How, how are you going to do anything with it? Well, people figured out, well, we can build micro traps. Well, yeah, there you have problems too. OK, fine. Then but people work on it. They're smart scientists that work out problem after problem. Um, and Progress will continue. I think the, the ultimately the answer will not be what we think it is at the moment. <laughs> I think that's pretty much safe to say. But uh, do you believe, Matthias, that the rate of progress is going to continue? I mean, we've seen in the hardware space tremendous difference what has happened in the last four or five years than what had happened in the last 15, as an example. Yeah. Do you think the pace is going to continue kind of as it is for the last four or five years, or is it going to be continue and accelerate? I hope it'll accelerate, especially with the availability of software and getting smart people, hopefully around the world, to plug into your devices to help figure out what, what the problems are and how to make things better without. But I mean, that's a big deal, because if you see what happened in the last five years, and you're saying five years from now, when we all sit here and talk about it, <laughs> right, that we're going to see a progress that is much more dramatic than the last five, that's a big deal. I mean, just think about how different the world will be, right, if we have achieved that. So. I think, it, it, you know, so people say it's, it's, you, you tend to overestimate what you can do in two years, but you tend to Understood. underestimate what happens in 10 years from now. Um, and I think that's because usually there is a bifurcation point. I think that bifurcation point is somewhere in the next five years for us. 
Um, okay. the, the bifurcation point is where the, 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 all the effort that we're making um, in terms of building hardware and all the effort we're making in trying to use it for something, something useful and interesting and important. Um, and you know, there will always be scientific value. So I'm not discounting that new science will always come out of this. Um, but there is a, also, also a tremendous economic point. If you look at what happened to silicon computers and, and why they were able to keep this exponential pace for a very long time, is because uh, it can actually do useful things that generate more value, and then there's more investment. It becomes a very exciting field, although intelligence comes in. And, and then you can actually take a really, uh, really nonlinear uh, <laughs> increase. Uh, whereas if that, um, so right now I think there's a lot of investment based on expectation that this can, can do something real. Um, and if that expectation is realized, I think this will just continue and, and accelerate even faster. But if people started to realize that the expectation is not being met, then I think things can fall the other way around. So I think it's really, really interesting. And, and I think the whole point of this conference, and again, I'm not surprised that we don't have, pin, we haven't yet pinned down exactly what that application and the point is. Um, but I think that's really approaching. That opportunity is approaching. I um, think that that will happen within the next three or four years, that first discovery of a application that has some amount of quantum advantage. You know, even that is a nonlinear process. So I think it depends on how we approach it. For example, um, if you think about how all these apps on the phones came about, right? Now, people had the infrastructure, but the, the approach there is let's give them some API, make it really easy for anybody who doesn't know how to build an iPhone to come in and you build an application on, on top of it. And then you really lowered the barrier for a very large number of people to come in and innovate, creative yep, young people. If you let that happen, I think instead of like, you know, 20 academic groups who are very smart focusing on it versus letting 20 million people think about what the application is. I think depending on how we search for it, um, the probability of hitting this is going to be much higher if we let it happen across in a, a much more open environment. So uh, I think it depends on how we approach this. <laughs> we'll really increase the probability of finding that point, but once we find that point, and then I think it really bifurcates. Right? So I think this really, um, at least in my mind, um, I think that's the, the, one of the greatest uh, contributions that I attribute to your team at IBM is, is you know, bring, bring this online so people can start working with it. Let, let that framework work out. Let a whole bunch of other people allow that to happen so we can actually provide better performance to a wider range of users in a more competitive environment. Because I think that will really open up the probability of, of us finding some real useful thing. So if that, I, th I think that's, that should be some of the very important strategy that we all collaborate with to try to open up. Because if that doesn't happen, this is going to go down. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised. OK, so question. Uh, Anthony, back there, next to Lior. Hello. Hello. Yes? Is it on? Yeah. Yes, OK. Uh, I want to ask a bit of a, a hippie question, and it's not totally serious. So do you think the quantum computer will make the world a better place? And I'm obviously <laughs> not as obviously ill-defined, but um, I'm a bit interested or curious in your reactions to that question. Let's put it like that. Well, we just heard a comparison with nuclear weapons. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, not weapons, uh, energy. <laughs> 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 But uh, okay, let's hear it. Yeah, what do you what do you think? I mean, do you just see it as like just like any other technology? It depends on how you use it, or do you have a perspective of? I mean, there is. You're probably. I mean, the biggest thing to, to talk about, right, is cryptography, right? And large scale quantum computers will do you know radically define redefine the security of of the internet as it currently exists, right? Um, I mean, I, I believe that the, the other outcomes, when people talk about simulation and you know, it, what it can potentially do for industries, I think in the end, you bet that yes, it's gonna make the world better. Um, but I do worry a lot about that, that next world, and I particularly worry about post-quantum cryptography, um, because you know, just think about the number of people you know who are work on quantum attacks on post-quantum cryptography. It's not a large number. There's, you know, like Sean's here, and and you have effectively worked. You know, lots of you have actually pushed in that direction. But it's not a large group of people who have validated that, and so that is a scary thought, right? Um, what happens if it is also true that those are not secure? Um, you know, as somebody who has some idea about the amount of stuff that goes around in our own internal network at Google, uh, that is a very scary prospect. Um, and so we should be honest about that. We also can say that we have at least a little bit of time. Um, but I do think we should pour significantly more resources in uh, making sure that those next crypto systems are secure. Um, and I strongly advocate that nation states should be doing a lot in that effort. 
So, well, let me take try to pose the question back to you. Right. So, every major uh, technology that's really changed the way that we do things in life, like internet. Now, has internet made the, the world a better place? You can always ask that question. I think it has enabled a lot of uh, uh, convenience, but all, all technologies do come with a, with a, with a backlash of, uh, of uh, problems. Um, and I think it's, it's really a matter of if, if new capabilities are made, are made available to us, I think, as, as Richard said, it's really up to us um, to try to figure out how to use it in a more beneficial way than, than the others. So, I think uh, as technologists, it will enable new capabilities. Um, and I sure hope that there are more people who figure out how to use it to our advantage and make it a better place than those who try to make it, uh, take advantages of it to, to make it a worse place. Um, but it, there is a lot of um, you know, value that, that goes into making that decision. OK, do we have any one last question? Yeah, we talk a lot about. Uh, quantitative speed ups, quantitative gains, et cetera, even how we define ourselves, I guess, in, in this area. Um, are there near term applications, even in a noisy regime, where we will find qualitative difference? We've touched on you know, new, new types of physics that we may be able to explore, et cetera. But are there things that really may be practical applications in a near term, medium term, noisy regime uh, that, that will have real practical applications that aren't just speed ups? Or not? <laughs> <laughs> I think the answer is we don't know. Yeah, right? I think. I mean, this was. I think a lot has been discussed along those lines for the past three days, and without any rigorous answers at the moment. Um, you know, something. I was mentioning this to Andrew. Sometimes it is depressing to wake up and look at some of you know some of the numbers that you might ultimately need versus where you are. Um, but things will. Things keep keep improving, people will innovate. So I think something will come around that is very useful, uh, but I can't really put my hands on what this exactly is at the moment. So, so I'm actually absolutely with uh, Matthias in, on, on that, because I'm, in a way, we're both fools, believing that this will lead to something very <laughs> useful. Otherwise, you know, we will go find something else to do that, that will actually make it lead to more useful things. Uh, and at the same time, you know, I, I fully accept the probability that I'm completely wrong, right? But I think until we give it the best shot we have and, and put us in that place. We just won't know. So is it worthwhile trying to make that effort? Uh, and fools like us believe that it is, and that's why we're doing this. <laughs> that's, that's a good role for research and you know, taking risks. So uh, I would like to thank all the panelists for uh, you know, taking the time to share your, you know, your thoughts and, and your knowledge with, with all of you. And um, so we're going to have an opportunity to close the conference and really thank everybody for your participation. So thank you for the panel. Thank you.